Okay, good morning. So let's start our fourth uh, talk. Today we have with us uh, Monica Sanchez. Monica is a postdoctoral researcher at the IRB, at the Biomedical Genomics Group uh, led by Nuria Lopez. Uh, she initially studied biology at the UB, University of Barcelona, then did a master's in molecular biology, half in Sweden, half in Norway, then a PhD in preclinical research at the Vallebron Institute of Oncology, uh, and then instead of like uh, starting a postdoc, she um, decided to do a master's, another master, um, uh, this time in omics data analysis at the University of Vic. Uh, and then uh, she did the, the, her final project of this master at the IRB, where she was um, yeah, immediately hired as a postdoctoral researcher since, since now for, for three years. Uh, her talk today is uh, entitled Cancer Genomics, Studying cancer, cancer, sorry, Cancinogenesis Through Somatic Mutations. Yeah. Please, welcome. Thanks a lot. Uh, so, hi everyone. So, as uh, Anna already introduced me, I'm Monica Sanchez. I'm a postdoctoral fellow in, in the Biomedical Genomics Lab. I will like uh, repeat a bit of the, the background. Just for I would like you to know that uh, in bioinformatics, actually how the field is right now, because the degree you're studying is quite new. So all the people is working in bioinformatics. It's different, actually coming from different backgrounds. So for instance, what was my career path here? I went uh, first. I studied biology in the University of Barcelona, and then I decided that I wanted to move abroad to have international experience. So I moved to Sweden to study at Lund University, and then I did my project in Bergen, in this beautiful city that you can see here in the we. Oui. <laughs> yeah, in this beautiful city, you see in this picture. So there I was like doing my project, I was doing wet lab, I was working with cell cultures, I was pipetting, and then after my master, I uh, got the opportunity to start a PhD in the Vallebron Institute of Oncology. And there I continued working in the wet lab, more experimental stuff. So, and then I was also working with mice in the animal facility. And after that, I discovered that there was a field called bioinformatics that actually that, uh, I was feeling very curious because I thought there was a lot of data out there that I wanted to analyze, but I didn't have the tools to do it. So therefore, I did my transition to bioinformatics and uh, I did this master at the UBIC in omics data analysis. I learned coding, and then I started my postdoc at the IRB Barcelona in this group. So this is the group that I'm working. As you can see, that we are like many people. This is Nuria Lopez Vigas. This is the group leader of my group. Um, we are coming from very different backgrounds. We have mathematicians, we have engineers, biologists, physicians, physicists. So all of us, I think it's very interesting that uh, all people are um, um, giving like a different perspective to what we are studying. And this is uh, giving like very interesting discussions in our group to study cancer biology. First of all, what is cancer? I think uh, this is a very basic question for, for you to understand later on what I'm gonna tell you afterwards. We are studying this disease that it is uh, uh, when a cell in the body acquires changes and it's acquiring capacities to hyper, hyper proliferate. And this hyper proliferation, after like many consecutive changes, uh, it will create polyps. For instance, here is the example of the colon, will create polyps. Some cells will start growing abnormally and eventually they will start invading tissues. And this is what it's called cancer. So a cell that starts dividing, starts multiplying, creates tumor, and eventually it, it's invading the adjacent tissues. Why cells become carcinogenic? Why the cell starts transforming and starts doing this uh, crazy behavior? So as you already know, or you should know that in the cells, we have DNA. This DNA can suffer damage from external agents, like the sunlight, UV, and UV sunlight. It's causing damage in the DNA, as well as tobacco smoking, and also uh, um, 
reactive oxygen species, for instance, so interlined cell damage. So there are like several out, uh, sources that could damage DNA, and this damage in the DNA eventually may, uh, may uh, uh, create a change in the DNA. I guess you, you know already what is DNA, what are nucleotides, and what is uh, uh, this sequence. So for instance here, this damage in the DNA, it's gonna create a change from an adenosine to a cytosine, okay? So, how we study mutations? So what we do is DNA sequencing. We take, oh, sorry, <laughs> we take a, a biopsy from a patient, and this biopsy, we extract the DNA, and when we extract this DNA, we put it in these fancy machines, and it will sequence the DNA. And this is what we are working in our group. We are like working with uh, DNA sequencing. And this is what it looks like when we get the results from the machine. I don't know if you have already opened the terminal and looked around, okay, so you recognize this black screen. I want you to carefully see if you see any like uh, DNA sequence in this uh, file. Do you see this? Is AAA, GAA, CAAA. So all of these are DNA sequences. This is what we get from the machines. And, uh, but then um, how we can understand where are the mutations and what are they doing and all of it. So us as bioinformaticians, we have to transform this data, this file into uh, other types of files that will help us to visualize where are the mutations in which genes are affecting and if they are causing or not the cancer. Okay, so I've shown you this sequence that we have generated in this machine. We have millions of these sequence. We have lots of these files, super heavy. They are uh, of uh, like maybe like uh, 200 gigas or so. So like for a, uh, a, a one, one single sample, it can be very heavy. Then after like generating all these millions of sequent reads, we have uh, algorithms that will do this sequence alignment. What is this sequence alignment? We have all these random reads that are like different cuts from the genome, but we need to put them, we need to know where in the genome are. We have this reference sequence generated because uh, there has been the, the sequencing of the human genome. Uh, I think it started around, the, I think it, the, in the 90s, and it ended in, 2000, in the year 2000, more or less. And they actually generated what it is that the template sequence of the human genome. So they have this generated this, this template. And in this template, we can overlap or we can like put this align, these tiny sequences on top of it to try to match where these reads are located, you know, where these, all of these little sequences, where do align in the reference sequence that it's already there. Uh, and then we can identify if any of these reads will have a mutation, so a change in the DNA. So if we have a T in the reference sequence, and this is an A, that will be a mutation from T to A in the sequence that we have from our sample, from our patient. I hope it's more or less clear. So this is the sequence alignment, and, we, and this is how we, uh, uh, after like sequencing the patient, we try to deduce what was the sequence of the DNA of that biopsy that we have sequenced. Before I show you that these are the FASTQ files, and now I'm going to show you how a BAM file looks like. And these are the, the BAM files will show the, the sequence alignment. This is the BAM file. I hope you recognize, I mean, we have these like DNA sequences, all of them pile up, all of them align, into the reference, okay? Well, this is, a, this is an intron, this is an exon, this is another intron, and these are all the sequences that are aligned, you see? We can actually recognize here there's this mutation that is sort of repeated. Here we have also other mutations that are only present in some reads, but not all of them. Here is this, another mutation. You see, 
they are colored. So we can identify once we align all the reads to the uh, reference genome, all the mutations that this patient has. Okay, so now we have all the mutations of this patient, but what we are interested in are in the somatic mutations. Any of you knows the difference between germline and somatic mutations? Have you heard of somatic mutations or germline mutations? There's a bit of a hint in the, in the slide. No? Okay. So, germline mutations are those mutations that are inherited, that are from our father and our mother, and all of our cells have these mutations, okay? But somatic mutations are those mutations that are unique for that sample, from that tumor. So our cells in our body accumulate mutations through life. Since we're born, we are accumulating hundreds and thousands of mutations in all the cells of our body. And we are interested in identifying those mutations, the mutations that are only on the cells that have accumulated through life, but not on those that are germline, that are inherited. How we can identify the, the mutations that are in the tumor that have accumulated through the life of this person, but those that are inherited. What we do is to sequence another sample from this same patient of normal tissue. It's very easy to extract blood from patients, so we usually use blood to sequence in order to identify the germline mutations. Okay, so now we have sequenced a tumor sample, tumor biopsy, we have sequenced a normal sample, a blood, and then we can identify which mutations are the same in both samples. Okay, so we identify all of the mutations that are in common from both samples. After that, we identify which ones are unique for the tumor. And then we can make the difference between somatic and germline. You understand it more or less? Okay, so uh, now I have explained you how sequencing works, how DNA sequencing works, how we detect somatic mutations. So actually, um, I can tell you that nowadays uh, it has been sequenced like thousands of tumors around the world. So there has been like many international projects that have been sequencing lots of samples, lots of uh, tumors. The first project that started was uh, the Cancer Genome Atlas, TCGA, in the United States. So it sequenced around 20,000 uh, primary tumors. It started in 2006 and it ended uh, in 2018, more or less. Then the ICGC, that was an international consortia, gathering the efforts of many hospitals, research centers around the globe to sequence uh, also as many tumor types as possible. Then the Peacock project started in 2014, and that was also an international effort. Uh, that was uh, a joint effort from the TCGA and ICGC to sequence whole genomes. So, TCGA and ICGC, there were a lot of whole exome and genomes, but what the PICO wanted to do was to sequence the whole genome, not only the exonic part, but the whole genome. And they were able to sequence up to 2016, 600 um, uh, whole genomes. Then we have also as well the San Jude Children's Research Hospital in, uh, in the United States, where it has been sequencing pediatric uh, um, samples, and it's still currently sequencing. And also we have Hardwick Medical Foundation project, which is also um, sequencing a lot of tumors, but uh, metastatic tumors from metastasis. Okay. So thousands of, thousands of tumors have been sequenced. We have all of this data. We can actually download it in our computers and, or we can as well, well apply and, and get this data. Uh, and but what, I mean, can we get information from all of this data of, of all of these tumors? So what my group has been asking uh, was if we were able to identify 
the genes and mutations that are causing cancer. So from all of these mutations that we are accumulating through life, which are the ones that are the ones that are responsible for this transformation of the cell? Which are the genes and mutations that are causing cancer? And from now on, I'm going to call these driver genes and driver mutations because they drive the hyperproliferation of these cells. I'm going to give you a bit of an overview of three tools that we have developed in our lab. Uh, these uh, tools are Intogen, PushDM, and Cancer Genome Interpreter. First, Intogen is the one that I'm going to explain to you first, and this tool is to identify which are the genes that are actually selected or are actually driver for cancer. One thing that it's very clear in the field of cancer genomics is that tumor development follows Darwinian evolution. I guess like most of you already know what was the uh, Darwin theory of uh, uh, um, variation in the population, that there is variation in the population and that this variation uh, may give an advantage, um, an advantage when the environment changes and give like some of these mutations may give an advantage to the environment and will be selected and then it will create this amplification or this like overgrowth of certain traits. So then we said that to find driver genes we have to identify the signals of positive selection. So what are the mutations that are selected to hyperproliferate? And how we can identify these signals of positive selection? What are these signals? Here are some examples. There are quite more, but these are some of the examples of the, of the signals of positive selection. For instance, we may have a gene that may contain an excess of mutations rather than expected. So if the genome is like equally mutated everywhere, we would, we would expect a certain number of, of mutations. But some genes appear much more frequently mutated than others. This is giving us a signal uh, that, uh, that this gene is important for cancer, that is driving cancer. Another uh, signal of positive selection is the formation of clusters. We may expect that the mutations may occur like uh, different sites, let's say, but sometimes we find mutations occurring over and over in different patients in the same place, in the same site. So this is giving us also a hint, a signal of positive selection. What else? We have as well domains in the genes. You know that genes, they have parts that are important for the function, that uh, this will be important for the function of the protein. So if in the domain region we find an aggregation of mutations compared with what we expected, this is also another signal of positive selection. So what is doing Intogen here? So we are taking all of the data that we have downloaded from these many international consortia, and uh, we have built this tool, Intogen, which detects, these are mathematical algorithms that will detect these uh, signals of positive selections that I've shown you, and it will identify which are the genes that contain these signals. And in this last release that we released this a uh, few months ago, we are able to find up to 619 cancer driver genes. And you can actually go to this website, intergen.org, and explore. So uh, I'm gonna give you a few websites from our lab. So if you want to explore later, later on, uh, yeah, you can go and, and, and check. So this is the website that I was mentioning. We actually have run Intogen for each one of the tumor types. So per tumor type, per each one of like bladder cancer, breast carcinoma, renal cell clear carcinoma, and so on. For each one of the tumor types, we have run Intogen. And Intogen is detecting different cancer drivers in different tumor types. And you can explore all of them. Next tool I'm going to explain is BushDM. BushDM is a tool that, well, after, after identifying which are the genes that are causing cancer, the driver genes, then in these genes, which are the mutations that are causing cancer? So this is what we ask in this tool. 
which are the mutations, the driver mutations in a driver gene. So uh, I want you to know, to make clear, that, uh, uh, that in the clinics there is a huge necessity to know and, al and al identify which are the mutations that are causing cancer. Because when we sequence a patient, we see thousands of mutations. But, uh, yeah, I mean, but we don't know which are the ones that are important, which are the, one, the ones that are significant. And especially this is important to know if we can give, like, a proper treatment to this patient. So when we check databases like CleanBar and OncoKB, these are public databases, uh, clinical databases, where uh, it is manually curated, so like uh, cl clinics, uh, clinicians, they go there and they manually annotate uh, which are the, uh, the variants if they observe that they, they may be pathogenic or they may cause cancer. But actually, there's like a grad great majority of mutations that we don't know what are they doing, if they are important for the function of the protein or not. So it is a necessity to, to know the, this function. So what is BUSDM doing? So BUSDM, it's a machine learning classifier. So what we want this BUSDM to do is to, make, to differentiate between driver mutations and passenger mutations. The driver mutations are the ones that we are recurrently seeing in when we sequence. And the passenger mutations, what we do here is to simulate ne neutral mutagenesis, to simulate mutations randomly in the genome. And this is what we are going to give to this machine learning classifier to be able to identify both, uh, both sets of, uh, to be able to, to classify mutations between driver or passenger mutations. So, driver mutations, I already told you before that mutations may uh, aggregate in clusters and so on. And this is the mutations that we have observed in the, in the, in the sequencing data. And then the passenger mutations are mutated that we have generated uh, randomly on the sequence. So, when we put these this, uh, observed mutations from the sequencing data, and these simulated mutations as a negative set. They put it as in, in BUSDM, that it's a machine learning classifier, and we tell this classifier, okay, these are my uh, driver mutations, these are passengers, so try to understand the difference between what is a driver and what is a passenger to be able to discriminate between these two. And then we are able to generate these sort of plots. This plot is a blueprint. This is a gene, okay? This is the length of a gene with its different domains. And what is doing BUSDM is when we actually uh, generate synthetically all mutations possible in a given gene, we tell BUSDM, okay, which, which one of these uh, mutations is driver and which one is passenger? And it will give you a score. A score where if it's from 0 0.5 to 1, it's likely to be a driver. It's predicted as driver. And if it's between 0 0.5 and 0, it's predicted passenger. If we check this blueprint a bit, with high, uh, we have done that for a total of 84 cancer genes. If we check this blueprint a bit uh, with higher resolution, we can see here that there is an enrichment of driver mutations in this site. As I think I told you before that some of the uh, domains are uh, sometimes selected for, uh, because they are like giving an advantage to the, to the cell to have mutations in, in certain domains. So here we see this example. We see that there is a, an aggregation of driver mutations in this, in this domain. And if we check the other rest of the, of the gene, we see that uh, most of the, muta of the mutations are passengers. And we can actually know why these mutations are uh, driver because the, we tell the, uh, the machine learning algorithm to tell us uh, which are the features, which are the characteristics that makes each classification. So we get the information if it's a, in a three-dimensional cluster, if it's a linear cluster, if it's a domain enrichment, and so on. 
to show you a bit more about the explanation of why a mutation is driver, I will show you this example in this single mutation, the substitution of a leucine for an arginine in this position in EGFR. And this is what we get. So we have this mutation, and through this uh, spider plot, what it means is that whenever there's a spike, it's because this feature is important for this being a driver. Why this mutation is a driver? Because, this, because it's in a linear cluster score. It's in a linear cluster. It's accumulated in a site that is recurrently mutated. What else? Because it's also in a three-dimensional cluster. So actually we are able, and now we are actually, uh, thanks to alpha fold, that we have uh, the, the folding of proteins, uh, of, 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 all, uh, of many proteins available, we are able to identify if clusters are not only like on a single side, but also if they are from three-dimensional clusters when the protein is folded. So we are able to also identify three-dimensional cluster. Also, if it's in a domain, and in this case, it's a phosphokinase domain. So this domain is important for the function of the cell. What else? It's a missense and also because it has been conserved through evolution. Okay, so going back to the, what was annotated in these uh, clinical databases, with Intogen actually we are able to annotate up to 50% of these variants of unknown significance. So we see that BushDM is really useful and it's helping the clinicians to identify and to know um, what is the, uh, yeah, what is the relevance of this mutation? The third tool that I'm going to show you is Cancer Genome Interpreter, and it's about how we um, transfer this knowledge to the clinics to help clinicians to understand what is going on with the patients. So first of all, I want you to, I want you to explain a bit what is targeted therapy and why this is important uh, also what I'm going to explain today. Targeted therapy is this therapy designed for uh, blocking specific uh, proteins or mutations. So, in this example, I'm here showing you, okay. In this example, here we have a mutation in a site that is affecting a gene. Let's say that this gene is BRAF, okay? And this mutation is creating this uh, protein change, okay, in this site. And this is going to make the protein, BRAF, uh, act as a driver. So it will create a hyperactivation of the protein. What targeted therapy does is to design specific molecules that will fit exactly this protein that it's actually overactivated in cancer. So it is important for us to know which is the alteration in the patient because then we can give the designed uh, treatment for that patient. And this is for every patient. So in this patient, we have this pro protein A that it's mutated, protein B and C. So for each one of these patients, there will be a specific treatment, targeted therapy or personalized medicine for each one of the patients. So, what is cancer genome interpreter doing in this context? So let's say that we have a patient and we want to try to find which is the best treatment for this patient. Then we sequence a biopsy from the tumor from this patient and we get all of these list of mutations, okay? So these are substitutions in chromosome one in this position, G2C, okay, but I don't know exactly what it means. So what we do, we put that in cancer genome interpreter and Cancer Genome Interpreter, it's going to use information from Intogen, whether if mutation is in a driver gene, from BUSDM, whether this mutation is driver or not, or predicted as driver, and also we will get information from many other uh, databases, like biomarkers or possible treatments, and so on. And this, it's going to give information for clinicians to find the best treatment for patients. And this is what we get. So when we put the list of mutations and we tell cancer genome interpreter to, to give us the information, we can see that uh, here is the list of, list of genes that are altered and these are the mutations that these genes have. 
and uh, the tool is saying that these are driver, rated driver, and that these are passenger, and, uh, and then as well if we click prescriptions, then we will have for each one of the alterations if there is any design drug for this alteration and which is the output that it has been checked. So for this drug, it's resistant, but for this drug, it's responsive. So we have here a list of uh, drugs or molecules that we could give to this patient for uh, a better treatment. So this is actually like helping clinicians in order to find uh, which are the drivers of these patients on this tumor and uh, which is the best treatment available. And you can also, I mean, go and explore here and, and, and check it yourself. Uh, another thing I wanted to show you is that we have been uh, preparing this uh, outreach activity. It's a website that you can also go, so I invite you to, to go to the website and to play around. So this is just to, uh, uh, we have done it for, like, for um, uh, students from high school and so on. But I think it's very illustrative to, to learn and to know what we are doing in the lab. So it is uh, simulating that you are, a, 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 um, you are a researcher and you want to find out uh, you know, what are the, are the mutations in this sample. And we ha you have to sequence it, and then you get an output. And this is a way of trying to uh, explain this to, to uh, the context of what we do to, to the general population. OK, so let's go back to the data. We have these thousands of tumors that have been sequenced. What else can we learn from somatic mutations? There are many things that we can learn from somatic mutations. And we actually, in our group, we have, doing, have been doing like many, many things. I will show you. Going back to this slide um, on how uh, DNA is mutated because it's receiving damage from external sources and this is creating mutations. Can we know how the muti mutations were originated? Can we know what was that caused this damage to make this mutation? So what we know is that some mutational processes leave footprints. And this is what we call the mutational signatures. So we are able to identify uh, mutational patterns in the genome that can uh, tell us which was the cause of this DNA damage. Let's go little by little. Um, first of all, let's go back to our list of mutations. So we have a biopsy, we have sequence, we have all the mutations. Let's count the mutations by type. So we count how many substitutions from C2A we have, how many C2Gs, how many C2Ts, and not only how many mutations, but also in which context. If they are surrounded by an A and A in each side, A and C, A and G, and so on. After counting all these many possibilities, we get this plot. This is a mutational profile. These in col are colored the type of mutations and each one of the bars are each one of these contexts. As you can see in this mutational profile, so this is a, the type of mutations in a given sample. We see that this sample has quite a few of the C2A, substitution C2A quite high here, as well as C2T, but not so much on C2Gs and not so much on T2As. So we will see a little bit of of the characteristics of the type of mutations that we have in this sample. What we can do with this mutational profile, we can decompose that into mutational signatures. So we actually have mathematical algorithms that calculates what is causing this profile. And we can identify, for instance, if it's a signature due to aging processes, like the aminization of cytosines, or if it's uh, because of the UV light exposure, we can know how many mutations in a given sample were caused because of the UV light. And also from tobacco exposure, if we see that there's like a lot of uh, C2A mutations, these may be caused because of the tobacco smoking. And we actually can know the source of the mutations in a given sample. We have identified more than 100 signatures 
um, but most of them, they, we don't know the etiology. So the mathematical algorithm, algorithm it's uh, um, showing it as, okay, this is a signature that is repeated in many samples, but uh, we don't know what are the cause in all of them. But there's like several um, uh, studies going on nowadays to actually try to identify all of them. And also, as you can imagine, uh, uh, lung cancer, it's like full of signature four, tobacco smoking cancer uh, signature. And also, um, if we sequence as well a melanoma sample, it will be full of UV light uh, mutations. Also, more things that are mutagenic and that are relevant of what we do in the lab. Some chemotherapies are mutagenic. Uh, so, chemotherapy is a very um, hard treatment for patients. Uh, actually, uh, it has been given for so many years. And uh, it's uh, sometimes in many cancers, still nowadays, the only solution for treatment for this type of cancer. If targeted therapy, as I explained to you before, it's not available because there is no compound for this type of cancer, then uh, patients receive chemotherapy. But this chemotherapy are very, very hard, very intense, and actually we have seen that this this, this, some of these chemotherapies are actually mutating the cells in our body, and uh, we accumulate mutations throughout the, our, our cells in the body. And this is the signature of platinum chemotherapy, SBS31. Another thing that we study in our group is tumor evolution and clonality analysis. If we go back to the, to the Darwin evolution uh, theory, so we have these driver mutations that give an advantage, and this will make the cell to grow and expand. Other mutations may appear and will also eventually expand and so on. And we may have a major clone, this dark blue one, and we have minor subclones, like this one in purple, in red, and dark blue, okay? So what we do as well is to study this sort of evolution, these appearances of different drivers through time, and how these can be selected, and also how these give us information, studying all of these mutations here, this gives information of when these occurred. So how we identify clones, from DNA reads. I'm gonna go little by little in this slide. Let's see if I, I more or less I've ex explained clear. First of all, we have two alleles from our father and our mother, okay? We have uh, two chromosomes, one from the father, one from the mother. In each one, for the same gene, from the same side, we have two alleles, major B, minor B, okay? This is important to know. Then, let's go back to the BAM files. BAM files, are these pileups, these aggregated sequences aligned to a reference genome, okay? We have all of these reads in this site, in this specific site, aligned. And we see this as a mutation, you see? So it was supposed to be an A, but then we have some reads that they are showing a G in some of the reads, but not all of them. So we can calculate the variable allele frequency. If we count how many Gs we have, but divided by the total number of reads, we have the variable allele frequency, which is 0 0.48. This is more or less 0 0.5, half of it. What does it mean? It means that this mutation is clonal, is present in all cells, but in one of the alleles. And we can actually, with this uh, type of plots, that we plot the variable allele frequency, we can identify which are the clonals, because they're the ones that are close to 0 0.5. As you can imagine, all somatic mutations will be heterozygous because uh, having the same mutation in exactly both alleles, it's highly uh, un un unexpected. So we can say that this mutation is heterozygous and clonal. So we see that if we get all the mutations that are like that, we see this uh, little mountain here on the, around the variable allele frequency of 0.5. Let's go to another mutation. Let's calculate again the variable allele frequency. In this one, we see that there was supposed to be a T, but there are some reads are showing a mutation into C. How many are they? One, two, three, four. Four over 38, a total of 38 reads. So this is much lower, it's 0 0.11. What does it mean? 
it means that these are subclonal mutations, that these mutations are only present in some of the cells that we have in our sample, but not all of them. It's a subclone. So this means that this is a heterozygous mutation, subclonal. Okay, let's see an example. So I'm gonna show you a bit of an example of the project that I'm working with. Actually, we are working with, in collaboration with San Juan de Deo. It's a pediatrics hospital. And actually, they told us that they had these very interesting patients uh, that they don't know what happened, but they developed a second tumor after some years, very different from the first one. So what happened to this patient? I mean, why a patient, a kid that was cured from cancer, then years later has another cancer that is very different from the first one? So they really wanted to know what really happened to these patients. And uh, then we did, uh, we did the analysis on these patients. For instance, we see here this patient that had the first tumor, rhabdomyosarcoma, was treated with chemotherapy, was cured, and after 3.5 years, developed a leukemia. Second patient, it was very young, and it was uh, uh, diagnosed with an ependymoma. It's a type of brain, brain tumors was treated, was cured. After nine years, it developed a diffuse midline glioma, another type of different brain tumors. So why this happened? Then we asked the hospital, okay, can you give us a sample, a biopsy from the first tumor, from the second, and from the blood? Remember, we need to get the germline mutations, so that's why we are always asking for the blood. We performed whole genome sequencing. We performed mutation calling. And here, because we have two tumors, we can identify actually which are the somatic mutations of one tumor in green, somatic mutations of the other tumor in red, and somatic mutations common in both tumors. And as well, the germline mutations that are once common in all three samples that we have sequenced. Then we do the clonality analysis, and then we do mutational signature analysis. Okay, so we can do, make these questions. You're using like a clonality analysis and mutational signatures. We can try to answer this question. When the second tumor appeared, before or after the treatment? Let's go to this exercise. This is a bit difficult at the beginning to understand, but uh, let's see if we can go slowly. So we had the, the first tumor that happened at some point, and then this patient was treated and was cured at some point. And this, when the patient was uh, treated, all the cells in the body accumulated mutations from the treatment, from the chemotherapy, okay? If then later on appears another tumor and this tumor appears after the treatment, that single cell that expanded into a full-blown clone, into a full-blown tumor, uh, then this tumor will show the same mutations in all, of the, in all of the cells, in the clonal cells. So treatment mutations will appear clonal because they will be common in all cells, because they will be coming from a single cell. However, the second hypothesis is that the, maybe the tumor was already there. Maybe we didn't see when the, uh, he had the first tumor and it was very, very there and it was very small, but it finally grew when the patient was diagnosed years after. So in this case, this means that there were already some cells, some group of cells in the treatment exposure. And all of them, they got platinum, platinum mutations. They accumulated platinum mutations. But when this tumor further grows, we will detect treatment mutations, but maybe in some subclones, but not in all of them. So this, this will mean that we will find treatment mutations in subclones. More or less, you see the reason, uh, reasoning here? Okay, let's go for patient one. So we sequence the, both tumors, we sequence the blood, we try to find if we can identify this treatment, signa this, uh, treatment signature. And then here, we do the variable allele frequency, we plot it, we, here we have all the uh, mutations occurring at 0 0.5, and lower, these are clonal, these are subclonal. 
And then we try to identify if there is any treatment related mutations. And here we see that the algorithm is showing that 932 mutations are due to this signature in this clonal uh, subset. So we separate these mutations from these, we analyze them separately, we don't see any subclones, we see that all of them are clonal. Okay, so mutations in this leukemia are clonal, the treatment mutations. So what does it mean, hypothesis one or hypothesis two? One, exactly. So that leukemia appeared after the treatment. So this leukemia may be a consequence of the treatment. So the treatment may have selected, mutated and selected this cell and then the patient uh, uh, develop a treatment related leukemia. Let's go with the second one, a uh, patient with uh, two different brain tumors. Let's see if we can find and try to identify platinum mutations. Here as well we separate subclonals from clonals. Here we see that uh, every tumor has its different like mountains, subclonal and clonal, so because it's, every tumor is different. Here we see that like, lots of subclonal alterations, but not quite many of clonal. Few, I mean, it's quite flat, but there are. We do the analysis, and hey, here the mutations are subclonal, are not present in the, among these ones. These are present in the subclones. So then, what does it mean? The second. That the patient had already two tumors, when was diagnosed of the first tumor, had already the second one, in another place, wasn't diagnosed, but fully developed nine years later. So this is what we were able to, to identify. Okay, so a um, bit of a summary of what I have explained to you. Uh, with mutations, we can discover driver genes and uh, notate which are the driver mutations and uh, through these three tools that, uh, that I have shown you. Uh, Intogen to identify driver genes, BUSDM to identify driver mutations, and all of this information together in Cancer Genome Interpreter to help the hospitals and clinicians to know which are the mutations that are relevant for cancer and if there is any treatment available. Second, we can identify patterns of diverse mutagenic agents like chemotherapy. I've shown you how useful it is this chemotherapy to, to study patients and as well to reconstruct the tumor evolution through colonality analysis. And that's it, and I hope I have convinced you that somatic mutations can be seen as a record of cell history. So here we, have, we see an example of Rome, where we see that uh, some uh, uh, these columns are very old and some of the houses are more modern, but all are all on the same place. And this is the same with the mutations. Some mutations occur very early and some others very late, but we can actually identify a bit looking at the mutations when, which one of those occurred earlier or later. And thank you for, for your attention. Just on time. Thank you yes? for this okay. clear Great. presentation. Very interesting work. Time for questions. So first, those on the priority list. Okay. Um, I have a, you know, a question, and I want to know your opinion. That um, do you think that we have improved in the field of cancer, or we need to work more in the following years in to fight against cancer? You said if we have improved, if we have. Yes. Uh, uh, well, it has been uh, quite a lot of improvement these last years, but we need to work much more, definitely. I mean, there are some cancer types that uh, with targeted therapy. Uh, we were able to find, like, for instance, breast cancer. Uh, it has endocrine therapy that has been working very good for a certain subtype of breast cancer. And this has actually increased the survival of, of this type of cancer. But for instance, we have another subtype of breast cancer, which is triple negative, that it's very dreadful still. So, or pancreas cancer, for instance. So for some type of cancers, the survival has increased a lot these last years thanks to targeted therapy, immunotherapy, I didn't mention, but also immunotherapy, it's a field that is growing. 
but uh, still much more it, it needs to be done, especially for pediatric cancer, because pediatric cancer is rare. It's not as common as in adults, but, uh, but the kid has his, his whole life, life ahead, so that's why it's also very important, and there needs to be much more uh, research on, on pediatric cancer as well. Yeah. More questions? Well, it's a similar question, but uh, do you think there are any recent advancements in cancer genomics that have the potential to revolutionize cancer treatment, or maybe one of the tools that um, created in your lab uh, may have that potential? Can you repeat the beginning of the end? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. Uh, do you think there are any recent advancements in cancer genomics that have the potential to revolutionize cancer treatment mm -hmm. or maybe uh, one of the tools you created in your lab? Yeah, actually, this is what we are working on. Uh, well, I, I already have shown you how, which is, I mean, the potential of annotating all these uh, mutations that are causing cancer and how this can inform clinicians. I think much more it will be done for sure. And it's now like there is like an exponential growth of machine learning algorithms that classify um, uh, uh, mutations and so on. Also on, uh, on imaging as well. I mean, there are like other, other labs that are working on um, um, classifiers based on imaging of tags and, uh, and, and magnetic resonance and so on to maybe, you know, they are able to identify uh, relapses and tumors better than the human eye, let's say. So yeah, there's like uh, still a, a, lot to, a lot to be seen, I think. More questions? Uh, uh, you said that pediatric cancer should be studied more. There is uh, some difference between regular cancer and cancer for kids, or maybe there is like difference in the uh, like uh, the way of treating it. Yeah, actually, that's a very good question. Thank you, because actually, uh, the main I mean, there's like the cancer of course. Um, uh, there's like a higher incidence of cancer with, uh, with aging. So when we get old, our cells are accumulating mutations through, through living life, and then eventually when we get old, we may have cancer. So pediatric cancer, why of course this early? When like uh, the, the person has, hasn't been that much exposed. And what we have seen is that mutations occur in the developmental stage. It's a developmental disease, rather than an accumulation of mutations through life. It's more of something that happens during the embryology, embryological part, the, uh, when the embryo is in the, in the, in the pregnant, that, that something, I mean, all mutations occur there, or maybe like some environmental changes occur there. We don't know exactly, but it's, it's very different because there are different type of tumors. For instance, this diffuse midline glioma never occurs in adults. It's always, for, it's always occurring in children. So, these mutations, these tumors occur when the embryo is developing. Because if you imagine a zygote that has to be divided and has to be transformed in many other tissues, it's very plastic. It's like, you know, kind of, um, you know, it has to be divided and be specialized in different, different type of cells. Um, so one can think that it's sort of easy that something can go wrong, you know? And if a mutation occurs and in a cell, and then this cell cannot be, mm, forming a, 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 a part of the tissue of the, of the embryo, but maybe states in a de-differentiated cell, uh, cell state, that maybe, maybe this is the cause of, the, of the, uh, the cancer in children. So it's different because it occurs in the embryo, embryomental stage. Yes. With so other tissues can be used instead of blood while identifying somatic mutations? Uh, uh, well, actually, like any other tissue that uh, we think it has little relationship with the tumor, for instance. So we can use the skin. We can use also like mouth swabs. Uh, we have to make an equilibrium of what is easy to, to get from the patient. Uh, actually, it's not that easy to get a biopsy from the liver, for instance, so it's much easier to take a piece of skin uh, or, or mouth swabs. 
Uh, and we actually sometimes have found ourselves that we had to use another type of sample than blood because if we have leukemias or lymphomas, which are uh, cancers that they develop from blood, we cannot use this, this type of sample anymore. We have to use another type of normal sample. So skin and mouth swabs are, are very common as well to be used. It is said that artificial intelligence could be in some way a new tool as good as it was Google. Do you agree with this in terms of cancer? Uh, artificial intelligence uh, better than Google. Well, actually, I'm already using sometimes more than artificial intelligence than Google on on my research. ChatGPT has been quite useful because, some, yeah, when when we scientists, we researchers, we we try to look for information. Sometimes I mean Googling, yeah, you, you can you can already see the results or or looking not only on Google but in PubMed in publications. So you know this website where we try to find literature or like uh, the background of a different of a certain topic. Uh, yeah, you can go to ChatGPT and write and write. Okay, give me I don't know like uh, what is a diffuse midline glioma and how can it be treated, and it will give you this information. So actually, it's uh, we are a bit like uh, we don't know how we are going to use it or. But, but yeah, it's, I'm sure it's going to revolutionize how we do science for sure. And yeah, and actually for coding, it's, 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 it has been very helpful in our lab. And when you're like, you know, you have to debug or something, a code that is not working, you just say, okay, I have this code. I mean, I, how can I solve this bug? And it won't give you the instructions. It's, yeah, it has been very useful and, and it will be more. Since you started your career in informatics, do you feel there is a request on having more scientists spe specified in this science field? Can you repeat, sorry? <laughs> Since you started your career in informatics, yeah. do you feel there is a request on having more scientists specified in this science field? Uh, yeah, actually it's a field that is growing. Uh, I think more and more um, bioinformaticians are like seen as, as uh, full researchers and Kind of we anytime more there is more like now I've shown you like DNA sequencing, but there is also single cell DNA sequencing, RNA sequencing. Uh, there is like also all this epigenomics. So there is like a huge amount of data that needs to be explored and analyzed. So anytime more a scientist will need the power of uh, programming or to know how to how to deal with the computational stuff and. I did this transition in my career, but many others also have also done this transition because there's, there's uh, definitely a lot of work to do and, uh, and it will be more, definitely. Yeah. Do you think there will be another treatment apart from chemotherapy, well, chemo, which um, won't affect that much the patients and with be better results? Yeah, so actually that's uh, what the field is aiming to. Um, actually, uh, yeah, so that's why all this like targeted therapy, it has been developed. The point is that we cannot have targeted therapy for everything, for all mutations, for all, for all patients. Um, there's also has been this immunotherapy going on. There are different types of immunotherapy because we know that the immune system, it's, uh, very efficient in a way of uh, killing tumoral cells. But when we actually diagnose tu tumors, uh, cancer, it's when the immune system is not capable of killing the cancer. So the tumor has learned to be ignored by the, by the immune system. And this immunotherapy, what it does is to um, enhance, again, the power of, the, of our own uh, immune system. So. Actually, this uh, immune, immune therapy, I think it's being quite a revolution in the field, but still it, it needs to be further explored and which are all the capabilities and, and so on. But definitely chemotherapy, uh, hopefully, I mean, we will stop using it at some point and we'll start with the less harassed uh, type of treatment, like immunotherapy. Any more questions? No, if not, let's thank again uh, Monica.